Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of this channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or you've been here and not done so already, please kindly don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help support the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video for your listening pleasure. With all of that being said, it's time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 19. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first case and ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Most of these take place in Canada, so if I mispronounce, city names or names or anything of the sort please forgive me i have done my research but i still am paranoid that i don't get it right so here we go disclaimer some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all listening discretion is advised The Disappearance of Emily Bailey Early Life Emily Bailey was born in December 1998 as the fourth of five siblings. She was close to her mother, Lori Bevan, and her older brother, Ben Bailey, with whom she shared many private jokes and kept in constant contact. Growing up, Emily moved between neighborhoods in East and Central Hamilton, Ontario, and attended four elementary schools between junior kindergarten in grade 8. While she attended Hill Park Secondary School as a teenager, she reportedly missed most of her classes, having become friends with a group of students who weren't necessarily the best people to hang out with. During this time, she continued to move around a lot, spending a few years in Brampton and struggled with depression. According to relatives and friends, Emily was full of personality and incredibly outgoing. While she may have struggled later in life, she was, at heart, a very good person who made friends everywhere she went as her sense of humor was contagious. As she entered adulthood, Emily began to struggle with drug addiction and homelessness, which she tried to hide from her family out of fear that they'd reject her. She managed to get clean twice, both times when she was pregnant, but found herself sucked back into that world once she had given birth. Given this lifestyle, Emily often found herself sleeping in tents or couch surfing, not the sort of environment you'd want to raise children. Her two daughters, Harper and Kinsley, lived with their grandparents. Emily was determined to make a change and was putting a plan in place to get clean, find employment and counseling, and get her girls back. In the fall of 2021, Emily began seeing a man named Jeffrey, or Jeff for short, Johnson, a friend's brother-in-law. The relationship was described as rocky by friends, who also revealed to the media that Emily soon got pregnant. The then 23-year-old also began to change. Once an avid poster on social media, by that December, she had stopped posting entirely. Disappearance the days before Emily's disappearance all her spending time with friends. On the evening of Christmas, she was with another close friend. She again visited this person three days later to dye her hair and have dinner. On December 31, 2021, she and Jeff visited another friend, Nikki. The trio hung out until about 10.30 p.m., at which point the couple got into a cab to return to Jeff's house. According to the driver, he and Emily were dropped off at the residence on Weir Street North, near Barton Street East and Kennyworth Avenue North. Emily had told Nikki they were attending a party, but many believe it was just the pair drinking at the house. She'd also reportedly messaged several people that day, inquiring about getting a ride somewhere. After Emily's disappearance, Brandon Hunter, her ex-boyfriend and the father of one of her daughters, claimed to have spoken with Jeff, who told him that the couple had gotten into an argument at some point that night. Emily left the house, but Jeff didn't say where she'd went to. 
At 2.39 a.m. the next morning, Brandon just so happened to send his ex a message on Facebook, which marked the last time Emily opened one from anyone. It's reported that the last time Emily was seen was between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. on January 1st, 2022 on Weir Street. She hadn't been seen or heard from since then. It took about a week and a half for the 23-year-old to be reported missing when she failed to attend a scheduled visit with one of her daughters. Brandon called the police on January 10th of 2022 after being unable to get a hold of her. Given she was in constant contact with her loved ones, this was seen as very out of character for Emily. The Search Police attempted to search Jeff's residence on the day Emily was reported missing, but he refused to let officer in, claiming he had COVID-19 and had just had hand surgery. He claimed the injury happened while he was sharpening a chainsaw on either January 2nd or 3rd of 2022. Given Jeff was the last person to see Emily alive, investigators conducted searches at properties he was tied to, including the house via a search warrant and a milling property in Dunville, Ontario. Forensic testing was done at the residence and nothing was reportedly found at the latter location. Emily's family had been active in the search from very early on, putting up missing persons posters, holding rallies and creating a dedicated Facebook group. They even contacted the organization, Please Bring Me Home, to see if its members would assist. While they did at first, the group paused their searches after speaking with the Hamilton Police Service, who stated that the investigation was still active. Bring Me Home tends to focus on cold cases. Two months into the investigation, in March of 2022, it was announced the case had been turned over to the Hamilton Police Service's homicide unit, with investigators stating that, based on the evidence, they believed Emily was murdered and her body was disposed of. They also revealed they were looking for information about the owner of a dark or black GMC or Chevrolet pickup truck that Emily may have been connected to a week before her disappearance. Jeff owned a truck matching this description, which had been impounded in November of 2021. He then borrowed a relative's truck, which was also black. The latter was searched, but nothing of any significance was found. In April of 2022, police posted a media release to dispel rumors that Emily's disappearance and presumed murder occurred at the hands of a serial killer targeting tattooed women in Hamilton and the surrounding area. The theory emerged after a post was shared to social media, suggesting a connection between Emily's case and that of 33-year-old Stacy Raspberry, who went missing in February of 2022 in the Nigeria region. Investigators said there was no evidence the cases were connected, nor was there a serial killer on the loose. Over a year later, on May 2023, an image was posted to Emily's TikTok account, which hadn't been active since before she went missing. It was a photo of a dog and featured a 15-second clip of 5050's song, Cupid. Investigators believe the account was hacked and said they planned to reach out to TikTok. In July of 2023, Hamilton's police board approved a $20,000 reward for information leading to the location of Emily's remains and the conviction of those responsible for her disappearance. By this point, more than 30 witnesses had been interviewed, several search warrants executed, and searches conducted within and outside of Hamilton. Despite these efforts, little evidence had been uncovered, while investigators saying they're running out of investigative avenues. Emily's DNA and information has since been uploaded into a national database. Investigators say there are people out there who know what happened, but they refuse to come forward. Details Emily Bailey was last seen on Weir Street in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on January 1st of 2022. She was 23 years old and was wearing a yellow Billabong brand hoodie and a long black winter coat. 
She was also carrying a light blue backpack with black handles. Emily is described as a white female who would today be 25 years old. She stands between 5'3 and 5'4 and weighs 100 to 134 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she had shoulder-length black or brown hair with dyed green highlights and her eyes are brown. The missing woman has two tattoos, an elephant on her left forearm and Batman symbols on the outside of her right forearm. Case Contact Information Emily's disappearance is currently being investigated as a homicide given the high possibility of foul play. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Hamilton Police Service at either 905-546-2963 or 905-546-2963. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. The Disappearance of Nancy Liao Early Life Nancy Luau was born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada on November 3, 1983. According to her loved ones, she was an outgoing social girl with a tight-knit group of friends. She was also known for being strong-willed. In the fall of 1998, she ran away from home for 18 days after her father imposed a nightly curfew. Not wanting to remain in her family's apartment and follow their rules, she stayed with a friend and continued to attend school. She also stayed in contact with her family. Her father was in hospital, recovering from surgery, and she visited him regularly. At the time of her disappearance, Nancy was a 10th grade student at Monarch Park Collegiate Institute. She was said to be an average student with no steady boyfriend. Lead up to disappearance. Nancy was last seen after she returned home from school on the afternoon of January 27, 1999. At around 3 p.m., surveillance cameras caught her leaving her apartment, located on Dundas Street East, near Parliament Street. The footage shows her standing by the rear door for approximately 10 seconds before she sees someone in the parking lot and runs out the door with a smile on her face. Unfortunately, there were no cameras outside to capture footage of the car or which direction it went. While this was happening, her father was napping in the apartment. Disappearance Nancy's father waited up for her all night and into the next day, wondering if she got to school to sit for a scheduled exam. He called the office, but was told teachers didn't take attendance during the exam period. As such, no one knows for sure if Nancy had been there. At the time, Nancy and her father had reconciled their differences and were getting along just fine. She also wasn't known to police and wasn't involved in any illegal activity, meaning there was no valid reason for her not to return home the previous night. That evening, her father reported her missing to the Toronto Police Service. Search Nancy's disappearance garnered little media attention in 1999, as the Toronto Police Service had classified her as a runaway. According to some reports, she told a family member she was planning on going somewhere that afternoon of January 27th, but didn't say where or with whom. They did say, however, that she didn't give any indication of wanting to run away from home. Since she went missing, Nancy had not contacted any of her friends, nor has she visited the Regent Park Community Center, which she was known to frequent. The case was reopened in June 2019. While tips were called in following a media release, no one had come forward to say they saw her after 3 p.m. on the day she went missing. Investigators have also not provided any updates on where the case stands. Case Contact Information Nancy Liao went missing from Toronto, Ontario on January 27, 1999. She was just 15 years old 
and was last seen wearing a white waist-length winter jacket, blue jeans, and black platform shoes. She has fair complexion and medium build, standing at just 5'5 and weighing between 117 to 121 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she had long, dark brown hair with blonde streaks and brown eyes. She has a small birthmark on her left cheek and a scar on the left side of her upper lip. Currently, the case is classified as endangered missing. If alive, she would be 38 years old today. Those with information regarding the case are asked to contact the Missing Persons Unit of the Toronto Police Service at 416-808-7411. Tips can also be called into the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at 1-877-318-3576 or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. The Disappearance of Betsy Owens Early Life Betsy Rosa Owens was born on July 7, 1973. As a member of the Powangasi First Nation, she was close with her sisters, Carolyn Owens and Valerie Livick, and loved swimming with them in Fishing Lake, the body of water that surrounds the community. According to her family, Betsy was a nice girl who went out of her way to avoid trouble. She loved music and at the time of her disappearance, was a big fan of Manic Monday by the Bengals. Disappearance On the evening of October 22, 1988, Fancy planned to attend a local dance with her boyfriend. Before going to the event, she played volleyball with friends at the local school. Betsy and her boyfriend left the dance at around 11 p.m. The last time he saw her was the next morning when she left his house. The search. Local community members conducted searches for Betsy immediately following the disappearance, but were unable to turn up any evidence. Subsequent searches conducted by law enforcement in 1996 and 1997 drew the same result. In 2013, Carolyn provided investigators with samples of her DNA, should her sister's remains be located. Each year, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police hosts a week-long campaign in recognition of National Missing Children's Day. Betsy's disappearance was one of the cases featured in May of 2019. According to Joe Owens, Valerie's common-law spouse, law enforcement rarely makes visits to Powangasi First Nation, with the lead investigator's last one occurring during the summer of 2014. Owens would like him to make monthly visits and organize a proper search of Fishing Lake. Over the years, rumors have circulated around the community, with the majority of residents believing they know who is responsible for Betsy's disappearance. The lead investigator on the case suspects foul play is involved, but states there isn't enough evidence to make any arrests. As of publishing, Betsy's family has not been told if there are any new leads in the case. Aftermath Betsy's parents have sadly passed away. They will never get to see their daughter again or at least the news that she has been found. I'd like to take a respectful moment of silence for Betsy's parents, please. Thank you. No parent should ever go to their grave not knowing where their kids are or not seeing them before they pass. Kay's contact information. Betsy Rosa Owens went missing from Powangasi First Nation, Manitoba on October 23, 1988. She was 15 years old and was last seen wearing a white cotton hooded sweater, a blue denim jacket, blue denim jeans, and white high top runners. At the time of her disappearance, she had a slender build, standing at 5 foot 3 and weighing approximately 119 pounds. She has long black hair and brown eyes.
Currently, the case is classified as a missing persons investigation. If alive, she would be 48 years old. Those with information regarding the case are asked to contact the Winnipeg Detachment of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at 204-983-5461. The Disappearance of Marquez Duncan, Jr. Early Life Marquez Duncan, Jr. was born of May 18, 1998, to parents Darnell and Tatisha Stevens Duncan. He was a native of the state of Georgia who had moved to Tuskegee, Alabama to attend Tuskegee University, where he was studying chemical engineering. Despite being away at school, Marquez ensured he kept in close contact with his family, especially his mother, who currently lives in Michigan. The pair were incredibly close and would video chat almost every single day. Lead up to disappearance. At around 4.30 p.m. on February 23, 2021, Tatisha was chatting with Marquez she recalls he'd sounded fine and was happy as he was planning to pledge to a fraternity at Tuskegee University. Marquez, who spoke with his father, who also said nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Marquez's roommate would be the last person to see him that night. According to reports, he'd last spoken to him after midnight while the two were in the kitchen of their shared apartment. Disappearance over the next few days, Marquez failed to answer his phone whenever his mother tried to call. Initially, Tatisha didn't worry, simply assuming her son was busy with pledging activities. When February 27, 2021 rolled around, Tatisha was beginning to worry about how her son was doing, so she began calling his friends, who informed her that they hadn't seen or spoken with him since the night of February 23rd. She later learned that while Marquez and his cell phone were missing from his apartment, he left behind the rest of his belongings, including his sunglasses, jewelry, and his wallet, which still had cash in it. Marquez was eventually reported missing to the Tuskegee Police Department. Investigation the Tuskegee Police Department reached out to the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, or ALEA, for assistance in locating Marquez. The Tuskegee University Police Department also offered to help, putting out a notice to students. According to Marquez's family and friends, it's out of his character for him to go so long without contacting anyone, especially his mother. Tatisha continues to call his cell phone every morning, hoping he'll answer, but it has been shut off. After he went missing, Marquez's family learned he hadn't been attending classes and was no longer enrolled in school. The timeline and reasoning behind this has not been released. Despite no longer being a student, the university has been very active in assisting efforts to locate him. Marquez's family is planning to travel to Tuskegee to conduct their own search, where they will be handing out flyers and speaking with neighbors. They are of the belief that his disappearance is the result of foul play. There is currently a $1,000 reward being offered by Central Alabama Crime Stoppers for information leading to his whereabouts. Case Contact Information Marquez, Quez for short, Duncan Jr., went missing from Tuskegee, Alabama on February 23, 2021. He was 22 years old, and he was last seen wearing a t-shirt and a pair of black gym shorts. At the time of his disappearance, he stood at six foot tall and weighed between 155 to 185 pounds. He had black hair and brown eyes. Currently, his case is being handled as a missing persons investigation. If alive, he would still be 22 years old. Those with information regarding the case are asked to contact the Tuskegee Police Department at 334-727-0200 or the Tuskegee University Police Department at 304-983-5461. 
334-727-8757. Tips can also be called in anonymously via Crime Alabama, Crime Stoppers at 334-215-7867. An update on this case. The Tuskegee Police Department has revealed that remains found on April 1, 2021 are those of Marquez Duncan, Jr. The case is now an active homicide investigation. The Disappearance of Amber Ellis Early Life very little has been publicly shared about Amber Ellis' childhood and early adulthood. We know she was born in 1988 to her mother, Donna, and that she has a stepfather named Tim Scott. She's also the mother of two children, despite living what the Ontario Provincial Police call a high-risk lifestyle. She regularly kept in contact with them. She'd Snapchat her daughter daily. At the time of her disappearance, Amber was living in Hagersville, Ontario, Canada. However, she had connections to the other locations in the region, including Hamilton, Norfolk County, Brantford, and Cambridge. Disappearance The exact date Amber went missing is unknown. According to family, she'd been out of contact since early February of 2021 with news publications reporting that she was last seen toward the middle to end of the month at a residence at 3698 6th Line in Oswekin, Ontario. The rural community is located within six nations of the Grand River Territory. Amber was reported missing by her mother on March 8, 2021. This was largely prompted by her lack of contact with anyone in the family, especially her children. Investigation The OPP's Criminal Investigation Branch took control of the investigation into Amber's disappearance. With assistance from the Haldeman County Detachment, the Six Nations Police Service, and the Branford Police Service, very little has been revealed regarding the investigation into the case. However, the OPP has shared there's unconfirmed information that Amber may travel to Western Canada. The latest update came in June of 2023, when the OPP, with the help of the Six Nations Police Service, launched an evidence-based search of the property where Amber was reportedly last seen. The grounds were searched, as was the area behind the residence, which the Ellis family states has been empty for quite some time. Investigators wouldn't say what they were searching for or what type of evidence, if any, was found. The OPP has interviewed dozens of individuals over the course of the investigation, with little headway made in the case. To help raise awareness and generate more tips, Donna created the Missing Amber Ellis Facebook group. Details Amber Ellis was last seen sometime in February of 2021 at a residence in Oswegan, Ontario. She was either 32 or 33 years old at the time and is described as having a thin build, standing at 5 foot 9 and weighing between 120 to 121 pounds. She had straight, long black hair and brown eyes. According to the OPP, Amber is missing some teeth with noticeable gaps. She also has a scar on her left thigh, the result of a stab wound, and a horizontal mark between her eyebrows. A Chinese symbol is tattooed on the nape of her neck. Case Contact Information Amber's disappearance is currently being investigated as a missing persons case with foul play suspected. The OPP is offering a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact either the OPP's Criminal Investigation Branch at 1-888-310-112 or the dedicated tip line at 1-866-549-2090.
Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1 800 222 8477. The Disappearance of Sunshine Wood. Early Life Sunshine Wood was born on April 6, 1987. Raised by her father, Anthony, her grandfather, and her great-grandfather from the age of 10. She grew up on the Montessori Cree Nation in northern Manitoba with her two older brothers and two younger sisters. She also spent six months in foster care for undisclosed reasons. Adored by her family, especially her brothers, Sunshine lived a relatively normal life. She was bubbly and outgoing, with a tendency to make friends rather easily. She also loved to laugh and didn't partake in the negative behavior some of the other teenagers in her community did. Hoping to become a nurse, Sunshine moved to Winnipeg when she was 16 and enrolled at Gordon Bell High School. It was a major change moving from a remote community of just a few hundred people to a large metropolitan area. She initially stayed with her uncle, but later moved in with a woman named Priscilla. Anthony wasn't sure how Sunshine met the woman, as she didn't disclose this information in their daily phone calls. Sunshine loved the social aspect of being in a big city and was known for her street smarts. However, Anthony began to notice a difference in his daughter. She started skipping school, and while she'd not previously touched alcohol, began drinking regularly. Concerned for her well-being, Anthony tried to convince Sunshine to move back home, but he was unsuccessful. Disappearance On the morning of February 20th, 2004, Anthony called his daughter to confirm their plans for the following day. He also stopped by to give her some money. Sunshine was last seen that night in front of the former St. Regis Hotel at 285 Smith Street near Portage Avenue. She and a group of her friends had decided to spend the night downtown, and they spent time at the hotel's bar. The last known surveillance images of Sunshine were time-stamped 11.45 p.m. that night. In them, she's seen holding the door open in the lobby for two unknown males before going outside to have a cigarette. What happened after that is unknown. While some sources say Anthony learned of Sunshine's disappearance the following day, it's since been clarified that he wasn't made aware until February 26th. He subsequently reported his daughter missing to the Winnipeg Police Service. Investigation Sunshine's case hardly received media attention, despite the Winnipeg Police Service saying her disappearance was out of character. To help get the word out, Child Find Manitoba teamed up with the Wood family to put up posters and collect tips from the public. Investigators interviewed the man in the surveillance footage from the St. Regis Hotel and have since stated that they did not believe him to have any connection to the case. In 2009, a tip was called in that claimed Sunshine was alive and well outside of Manitoba. However, this information was never confirmed. Project Devote, a joint RCMP Winnipeg Police Service task force dedicated to looking into the cases of Manitoba's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, took over the investigation in 2012. It ran for eight years, with the latter starting its own model in 2020 that has community-based focus, incorporating grassroots organizations. No updates were provided as to how this would impact the investigation into Sunshine's disappearance. Details Sunshine April Hilda Sunny Wood went missing from the St. Regis Hotel in downtown Winnipeg, Manitoba on the evening of February 20, 2004. She was just 16 years old at the time. Sunshine is described as having a heavy build, standing between 5'6 and 5'7, and weighing 220 pounds. 
She had shoulder length, straight, dark brown or black hair and brown eyes and was last seen wearing a dark gray Exco sweatshirt, blue jeans and black boots. Sunshine has a number of distinguishable features including the following tattoos. SW on her left hand, the letter L on her left index finger, Sunny on her left forearm, the letter B on her left thumb, Destiny and a heart on her right forearm, and 11 on her left middle finger. She also has numerous cigarette burn marks on her left forearm. Case Contact Information While characterized as an ongoing missing persons case, Sunshine's disappearance is being investigated as a homicide. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Winnipeg Police Service at either 204-204-986-6250 or 204-986-6060. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 204 204- 786-8477 or 1-800-222-8477. The Disappearance of Tanya Marie Mural Early Life Tanya Marie Mural was born on June 20th, 1976 to her parents, Vivian and Jack. Vivian worked as a bakery manager while Jack was a carpenter who built new homes for Ulrich Homes on the west side of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. According to those who knew the family, Vivian and Jack were known for their partying lifestyle, their use of marijuana, their love for rock music, and for riding Harley Davidson motorcycles. The Mural family resided in a small rented bungalow at 10426-145 Street in Edmonton, an area which is said to have been the home to numerous registered and convicted molesters and, I can't say the R word, so I'm just going to say, sexual assaultists. Tanya is described as having been a happy child whom everyone loved, while quiet and content, she was also known for her love of singing and tap dancing. When she wasn't playing with her Barbie dolls or in the sandbox in the family's backyard, she could be found in the water as she was a really good swimmer. When she grew up, she hoped to become a veterinarian as she loved animals. Lead up to disappearance. At 7.30 a.m. on January 20th, 1983, Tanya's aunt, Berta Stortz was dropped off at the mural home by her common-law husband as she would be babysitting the children for the day. To her recollection, Tanya and her five-year-old brother, John, were eating breakfast while Jack left the house for work. Vivian is said to have been talking with her daughter before she, too, left the house at just after 8 a.m. According to her fellow classmates, Tanya was last seen leaving her first-grade class at Grosvenor Elementary School at around 11 a.m. She was meant to meet with John and the pair were going to walk home for lunch, where Vera was waiting for them. When John exited the school, he found his sister was not there and assumed she went on without him, so he made the block and a half trek home himself. Disappearance John arrived home at 11.20 a.m., when questioned by his aunt as to his sister's whereabouts, he explained that other students had told him that Tanya had gone to a friend's house for lunch. However, when Vera went to check, she found her niece was not at the house. Concerned, Vera contacted Vivian at work, who automatically knew something was wrong. While she hoped her daughter had simply gone to a friend's house, she couldn't shake the feeling and decided to head home. When she arrived, she learned that Vera had been searching up and down the street for Tanya to no avail. Jack was also contacted and sharing the same feeling as his wife. Immediately returned home to search for his missing daughter. Hoping to find Tanya in class, Vivian went to Grosvenor Elementary School, but found her daughter's desk empty. 
At this point, she phoned the Edmonton Police Service and an officer stopped by the house where he made note what Tanya was wearing and began a door-to-door -door search of the area. Throughout the course of the day and into the night, Vivian and Jack hoped their daughter had simply decided to have an impromptu sleepover with a friend and had forgotten to inform them. But she failed to show up for school the next morning. She has not been seen or heard from since. The Search Initially, those investigating Tanya's disappearance weren't quite sure how to handle it. However, the police did state they believe she left via the elementary school's east doors at approximately 11.10 a.m. and didn't wait for her brother's class to break for lunch. The story made both national and international news, with outlets across Canada and the United States reporting on Tanya's disappearance. For weeks, her case was the lead story on local newscasts. The search for Tanya involved hundreds of personnel, including police officers, friends, relatives, and citizen volunteers. The ground search was the largest up to that point in Edmonton's history, with hundreds of city blocks, including alleys, ravines, and the neighborhood where the Mural family lived, checked by those on foot and by vehicle. Despite the extensive searches, her clothing and school books were never located. Neither were any witnesses. Only her Safeway bag was located at the school. According to some of the children who attended Grosvenor Elementary School, they had seen a girl being chased by a German shepherd, but this has not been substantiated, and it is currently unknown if the girl seen was Tanya. Investigators were flooded with tips about the case, but few turned out to be of any significance. Both of Tanya's parents were ruled out as suspects, as they were both at work at the time of her disappearance. However, due to their drug use and partying lifestyle, investigators were of the belief that someone who was acquainted with the family could have possibly been involved. This theory was further spurred on by community rumors, which said Jack had owed hundreds of dollars to a small-time drug dealer for some marijuana he had purchased. Not long after Tanya vanished, the family dog Harley disappeared. However, foul play was not suspected. At one point during the investigation, Tanya's parents were the victims of an extortion attempt a crime for which a man was eventually convicted. In the summer of 2008, a basement was excavated about 20 blocks from where the family lived in 1983. This search was the result of a tip the lead detective received from a woman who claimed she had been a playmate of Tanya's and was suspicious about a hole in the basement of her family's home. However, the excavation turned up nothing. Around 30 years after the disappearance, a former friend of Tanya's came forward to say the missing girl had approached her on the day in question to say she was going to the nearby 7-Eleven for lunch, as she had some spare money. According to the woman, she last saw Tanya walking alone in a southwest direction toward 144th Street toward Stony Plain Road at 147th Street. This case is considered the biggest missing child case in Edmonton's history. Currently, investigators are of the theory that she was abducted and murdered. Throughout the course of the investigation, they have checked with molesters and, the R word again that I can't say, who were known to live in the area. Theories Number 1 The primary theory in the case is that a man who has known the family abducted Tanya. An alcoholic, he was 31 years old at the time, did not have a solid alibi for the day the young girl went missing. According to those who knew him and the family, he had taken Tanya and her brother alone camping, and around the time of her disappearance, he'd wrote her a poem about a love that could never happen. He is also said to have been violent, having once smashed a beer bottle into a man's face while playing cards while another time he turned off the ignition of the mural family station wagon, resulting in the car entering a ditch. Around the time of Tanya's disappearance, 
he moved away from Edmonton and would later have a daughter, whom he named after the missing girl. Investigators interrogated him for 11 hours, and while he didn't explicitly deny abducting Tanya, he is reported as saying, fuck you, you ain't got a body, and a polygraph test proved inconclusive. The evidence they did have resulted in the police offering him a plea deal of second-degree murder, of which he refused. He has never faced any criminal charges in relation to the case because, while detectives believe they have enough for a murder case, they fear the evidence may not be enough to secure a conviction. The man is also a person of interest in the 1979 disappearance of a nine-year-old Kevin Reamer, who went missing after he wandered away from his family's campsite in Elk Island National Park in Alberta. The young boy's body was eventually found not too far from where he was last seen, and the person in question is said to have worked at the park at the time. According to Vivian, the man was not capable of harming Tanya. A stance further backed up Jack. This was despite her friends warning her to not let him near her children. These friends would report years later that Vivian had changed her opinion of the man and believed him to have killed her daughter. Currently, the man's whereabouts and whether he is still alive are unknown. His last known location was Ontario, where he moved in the spring of 1983. 2. A second theory in the case is that Tanya was taken by a woman who couldn't bear her own child. This is a theory held up by the missing girl's younger sister, Elisa, who believes she's still alive and has been brainwashed. The basis for this theory is a witness who reported seeing a woman dragging an unwilling girl down the sidewalk at 144th Street near 104 Avenue around the time of Tanya's disappearance. Aftermath Two years after her disappearance, Tanya's sister, Elysia, was born. Unable to bear the stress brought on by the case, the family eventually relocated to Kelowna, British Columbia. Jack and Vivian would divorce in the 1990s as a result of the mental and emotional toll of Tanya's disappearance. They both developed substance abuse issues and have since passed away. Vivian in 2011 and Jack in 2005. Tanya's brother, John, also suffered from substance abuse problems later in life and would eventually die as well. Tanya's parents set up the Tanya Mural Missing Children Society, which is said to be the first agency in Canada to have a sole focus on missing children. The society dissolved a few years after its creation due to the toll of Tanya's disappearance on the family, but its legacy is not lost. The case resulted in the creation of the first Alberta chapter of Child Find, and the organization said that the case continues to serve as a reminder to parents to ensure their children know what to do in the face of danger and how to avoid it. A book titled What Happened to Tanya, was released about the case. Case Contact Information Tanya Marie Mural went missing from Grosvenor Elementary School in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, on January 20, 1983. She was six years old and was last seen wearing black Harley Davidson t-shirt, a blue and white winter coat with fur trim around the collar, high brown boots, and white bikini panties. At the time of her disappearance, she stood at 3 foot 2 and weighed approximately 45 pounds. She had sandy blonde to light brown hair, and her eyes are said to have been either brown or hazel. Her ears were pierced, and she had a birthmark on her right temple, which is about the size of a quarter. Currently, the case is classified as a non-family abduction, if alive, she would be 44 years of age. Those with information about the case are asked to contact the Edmonton Police Service at 780-421-3382 or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at 
1-877-318-3576. The Disappearance of Autumn Shaganosh Early Life Autumn Shaganosh of Constance Lake First Nation was born in 1996. She always wanted to spend time with friends and talk to her family, and she was known for her sense of humor and frequent use of social media. Autumn was also known to frequent Barry Ontario's Native Friendship Center. At the time of her disappearance, Autumn was living with her sister, Lily Ann Moore, in Barry's Allendale neighborhood. Despite no longer living at home, she kept in regular contact with her mother, Esther, via Facebook Messenger. The 26-year-old was struggling with depression and anxiety and had begun to abuse alcohol, but was receiving treatment. Disappearance Autumn left her sister's house near Burton Avenue and Frank's Way at 9 p.m. on June 9, 2023. She told Lily Ann that she'd be back later, and surveillance footage showed her walk past a nearby convenience store, cross the road, and meet an unknown individual. Later that night, Autumn messaged her cousin to say she was heading to a bar. However, she didn't specify which one or with whom. At 11 p.m., she texted Lily Ann and told her she'd be staying out late and planned to return home the next day. At between 9.30 and 9.45 a.m. the next morning, her sister received a text from her Autumn asking to be picked up. Despite responding just three minutes later, none of Lillian's messages went through, leading her to assume Autumn's cell phone had died and needed to be charged. Surveillance footage was later found time-stamped 10 a.m. on June 10, 2023 which showed the 26-year-old walking in Sunnydale Park area with an unknown man during the walk to end ALS. She was carrying a pair of skis. Two days later, without any contact from Autumn, a family member called the Barry Police Service to report her missing. There has been no activity on her bank account or phone since the last time she contacted Lily Ann. Investigation Autumn's family was able to gain access to her laptop and sift through her social media accounts. She appears to have been messaging someone early on June 10, 2023, around the same time she texted her sister to pick her up. While she didn't give this unnamed individual the house number or address, she did provide the street name. The family were also able to access Autumn's Snapchat account and save several messages from the night prior. They reportedly showed an unknown male in the interior of a house. A street name was also visible in some of the images. The Barry Police Service is in charge of the investigation into Autumn's disappearance. Autumn's family have shared their concerns that she was possibly forced into human trafficking, something investigators haven't fully discounted. The authorities have conducted ground searches with canines, followed up on leads, and put the case in the national database. However, Anthony's family has criticized how they're handling the case, in particular, what they perceive to be a lack of urgency after they reported the 26-year-old missing. To supplement what they feel has been a lackluster investigation, they have put up posters looking into tips themselves and organized their own searches. They have also raised money to hire a private investigator. Details Autumn Hope Shanosh was last seen in the Sunnydale Park area of Barrie, Ontario on June 10, 2023. The 26-year-old was in the company of an unknown man and was seen carrying a pair of skis. The pair were in the area around the same time as the walk to end ALS, and the Barry Police Service is asking anyone who attended to look through their photos and videos and to contact them if 
they spot anything suspicious. Autumn is described as having a medium build, standing at 5'3 and weighing 130 pounds. She has brown eyes and straight black hair and was last seen wearing a black hoodie or jacket, either beige leggings or a pair of shorts, sources vary, and slip-on puma sandals. She also had her nose and septum piercings. The missing woman is known to suffer from anxiety and depression, as well as asthma. She's prescribed medication for these conditions, which she hasn't had access to since she went missing. Case Contact Information Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Barrie Police Department at 705-725-7025. Tips also can be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 19. I'd like to take a brief moment and give a very special thank you to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all for your support and investment in the channel. I am forever indebted to you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. Always stay vigilant, and I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.